Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. I know that there was that how many times a day do you think about the Roman Empire meme that was going around a few weeks back. I just want to throw it out there. This is my Roman Empire. I am an absolute sucker for all things to do with dragons, and we don't get to talk about dragons in Destiny anywhere near enough. So that's what we're going to be doing for today, and for a few other days going forward. I asked you all on Twitter if you wanted to hear me ramble about dragons for a while, and everyone was like, yeah, dragons are awesome, dude. Go ahead and do it. So here we go. In this video series, we'll be diving back into the Ahamkara archive, and we'll be digging up the deep lore of Destiny's dragons. But first, a word from our sponsors at HelloFresh. With the holidays around the corner, we're all in for our fair share of utter chaos. Luckily, you can save time and keep things a little bit less stressful thanks to HelloFresh, and that means you can use the holidays for what they're meant for, actually taking some time with your family and loved ones. You can get their meal kits delivered to your door, and they can take as little as 15 minutes to prepare. These kits save the environment and save you time, money, and effort by having all your ingredients pre-portioned. Less waste is good for everyone. There are also over 45 weekly recipes for you to try, so you can keep trying new things until you find something you love. So thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Use the link in the description and use my code POGBIFE FREE to receive one free breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. Thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. So initially I was thinking about just making a single video on dragons and calling it a good day, but I started writing and writing and writing and I realized I had a problem because I got to 16 pages in the script and I'd barely got to, well, the Great Hunt, the most important event of Ahamkara history. So yeah, we're going to make a few videos here. They're all probably going to be long and nobody can stop me. Miniseries time. Also, there are a bunch of people in the lore community making videos in Ahamkara right now. It's a hot button topic, I think, especially with the whole Wish 15 thing slash the Wish card within the Deck of Whispers coming up a few weeks back. So yeah, go ahead and check out other content creators. In particular, I was talking about this with Smart over on Psalm Lab, and as it turns out, he was also making a video on this topic. Perspectives are really important in the lore, so I recommend you go ahead and check out his video. It's only 15 or so minutes, but I found it insightful, so I think the likelihood is that most of you guys will too. You can find it down below. Check him out for more stuff on the lore, and in particular this time around for more stuff on dragons. Years ago, I did a few videos on this topic, and, well, it's a lot of disparate stuff, I've realized. I've done videos years back in Forsaken on the Ahamkara in the Dreaming City. I've made videos on Riven here and there. I've made a few videos about the context of the hive that surrounds the Ahamkara. I've made videos about the whole wish card within the Deck of Whispers. And I've realized that a lot of the content out there is really disparate. It's disjointed, and there is no point at which someone goes through the entirety of dragon history chronologically in Destiny. That means this time I'm going to try and do that, and as we cover the Ahamkara in this episode, we're going to cover the times before the Great Hunt, and their interactions with both the Hive and the Awoken. It's a lot of history and a lot of lore, so let's dive in. But first of all, some general background and some talk about physiology. What are Ahamkara? Ahamkara are a species that seem to crop up in the wake of the Traveler. At very least, we know this to be true in Sol, given that they weren't a native species to our system prior to the Golden Age. They prominently roosted on Venus in our system, but that's no longer the case, given that they are extinct. The major features of an Ahamkara are hard to describe, given that they are shapeshifters. One might question how limited this ability might be, but as far as we know from the lore, it's actually incredibly sophisticated. While we've only ever seen Riven and the Ahamkara illusion within Savathun's throne world, they are not the only forms that wish dragons can take. There is documented proof of Riven changing size, shape, and pigmentation, and this isn't even to touch on the more sophisticated forms of shapeshifting that are apparently possible for wish dragons. These include the addition of distinct biological features, such as horns or antlers or wings, and even the ability to change their shape so much that they can become a recognizable human, having a sort of doppelganger effect. 
You could literally be standing next to an Ahamkara in Destiny's universe and you wouldn't know it, because as a shapeshifter they can change their form into any form imaginable. A lot of this may be to do with how perception and wish magic works, but that's a topic for a moment later. I should also use this moment to dispel a rumor. Back in Destiny 1, there were these flying beasts that were spotted in the skies of Venus in the Ishtar Sink. Tantalizing as the possibility was, it was confirmed years ago on a Bungie livestream that these are not Ahamkara. The devs at the time called them Batadactyls. Regardless of whether that's a real classification or a bit of tongue-in-cheek, it seems clear that the Ahamkara are not the same as these beasts, because the Ahamkara are extinct and the Batadactyls are very much not. Another notable feature of the Ahamkara is the way that they've evolved to feed on desires. They do this by the practice of their wish magic. This in itself is a powerful but subtle mechanism by which the Ahamkara can create a Faustian bargain with anyone who projects their desires nearby. Deals can be entered into voluntarily, but in many instances the Ahamkara are like metaphysical predators, preying specifically on desires that involuntarily arise within their presence. It is known that when an Ahamkara is enacting such wish magic, its eyes begin to glow. We see this expressed in the Last Wish Raid. When we face Riven of a Thousand Voices, her eyes glow at the moment when we need to fire upon them, and if we fail to, we are wiped. With this white mechanic, should Riven not be appropriately countered in this moment, her sheer power is enough to destroy us entirely. It is implied that Ahamkara feed more on wishes from those who have a strong will. This is implied by the notes of the Last Wish, where seemingly it could only be enacted by the will of six paracausal light bearers, aka us guardians. It's worth remembering that there are many beings out there in Destiny that have a strong will. Beings such as the Taken King, the Witch Queen, Queen Marasov, guardians of many stations, all of them have made deals with Ahamkara in one way or another, and many of them have had long-lasting circumstances and have likely been a bountiful feeding for whichever wish dragon was involved. It's also implied that the Ahamkara grow more powerful from wishes that have room within their bounds to be twisted and exploited. This was a fact that was not lost on the Awoken, and at a certain point in time, Mara Sav even created the Wishing Wall so that she could input more specific wishes to Riven. The symbols that would appear on it would create a specific language to communicate desires, and with this language there would be less room for manipulation. But even with this specific system of inputs, Riven mirthfully, but privately, delighted at the veritable banquet of ways for Mara's wishes to be twisted. But what does a twisted bargain look like? Well, the classic Faustian bargain example might be wishing for wealth and then being showered in gold coins that smother and crush you. The best example of this in my opinion in Destiny's universe though, comes from Praedith. We'll cover this more in depth when it comes to our next episode, but Praedith is a key example here because it's possible that his time lost within the Vault of Glass is the result of wish magic. Praedith was a powerful warlock in his own right, but his conduct in the Great Hunt potentially sealed his fate. As he faced down a plethora of Ahamkara at the side of Kabir the Legionless and Pahanin, he delighted in the battle and wished that it would go on forever. Too late to realize what he'd done, an Ahamkara seemingly deciphered his desire, as can be seen by the fact that its eyes shimmered before him, just before it was killed. Braidith would then, of course, go on to raid the Vault of Glass alongside his two other companions, and would be stuck within its depths for an indeterminate amount of time. In a certain way, his battle was indeed unending. The exact wording of this is something I'll go over when we get to that particular point in the video, but it just goes to show how an Ahamkara can manipulate the space within words. Ahamkara are also noteworthy because they are some of the first characters we see in Destiny to use the notable O noun mine syntax pattern. What does this mean? Well, it's complicated and we don't truly know, but here's the best explanation we have. Previously, you might have heard characters such as Callus, Savathun, and Riven use this pattern of speech. Whilst we do have an explanation of it, it originates from truth to power. 
For those not in the know, this law book is notoriously untrustworthy, as it lies to you at multiple times, claiming at first that it's Eris, then it's claiming it's a non-existent AI bound to the Warmind Rasputin known as Medusa, before hinting that it might be Quarrier, before warping the reader into a dream sequence slash choose your own adventure vision. Then all the same happens in reverse as you escape. It's a bit trippy, reading it is quite the experience, but one thing is clear, it can't necessarily be trusted. So even if you don't look into truth to power as a source of salient truth, here what is stated about the O-Noun mind syntax is one of the only things that is stated about it at all in the whole lore. So we're going to take it with a pinch of salt and talk about what it says there. Truth to Power starts by stating that the sentence structure is something that is shared by both the Worm Gods and the Ahamkara. It notes that these two species are separate despite many similarities to them throughout the lore, one of which we'll get to later which puzzles lore junkies to this day. The syntax structure used by both of them of O Noun Mine supposedly acts like a bit of a cage, and we can see this by the literal way it's structured in the English language. O oh, murderer mine is a demonstration sentence that we'll use for this. The structure of the sentence acts a bit like a cage, with the O oh part of the sentence being like an invocation of power about to be exercised, and it's also like an invitation to whoever is being involved. The mine part at the very end of the small sentence is capable of denoting someone's possession by the speaker and places them in a subservient position literally within the sentence and relative to the person who is invoking this particular syntax. The word in the center is literally trapped between the O and the mine in the sentence, as is the person who is being invoked within this sentence by the invoker. By doing so, the Worm Gods and the Ahamkara have supposedly devised a method of creating ontomorphic power onto those that they describe with this sentence. What does ontomorphic mean? It literally means to change something. Ontomorphic is adapted from the Greek word on or ont, apologies for the lack of proper pronunciation there, and the Greek word morph, meaning to shape or form. Therefore, ontomorphic is a phrase which has been invented, but it means to change someone's form or shape. I think we can determine that this isn't literally meaning to change someone's shape so much as it is to invoke a change in our destiny or to exert a degree of power over us that twists us to the desires of the invoker. According to Truth to Power, this is something that the Hive Worms and Ahamkara evolved separately but logically. Truth to Power compares this syntax ability to how many creatures evolved eyes independently but that it also places both the Ahamkara and the Worm Gods in a similar ecological niche, perhaps as predators of the metaphysical, who prey upon the desires of others and gain power from the subjugation of their supplicants, who come to bargain with them. Keep in mind, everything I just stated in particular about the O Noun Mind stuff is untrustworthy. It comes from Truth to Power, the absolutely least trustworthy law book. We have no reason to believe that that's the whole truth, and we have no reason to believe that there aren't some half-truths in there for good measure. At current, it represents our only true source of information on the matter, so we have to use it for the time being, and just keep the imperfect nature of that information in mind until something adds the necessary clarity for us to adjust our perspective. The last key detail that we should state about the Ahamkara is that their wish magic abilities are latent even in the event of an Ahamkara's death. And this right here is the reason why the remains of a wish dragon are so sought after. Guardians are persistently looking for a source of power, and hunters and warlocks aren't exactly well known for being risk averse in one way or another. Ahamkara are in this way a powerful ally and a powerful enemy to the respective guardians that interact with their bones. The most notable guardians to have used Ahamkara remains include Eris Morn, whose clutch, or rock as it's more commonly referred to, is actually a shard of Ahamkara bone. Making a bargain with an Ahamkara in a moment when she was lost within the Hellmouth is seemingly the reason why Eris Morn was able to survive and regain her sight from the eyes of an acolyte. 
One might also think of the Iron Lord Gelion, who was utterly notorious for his consistent use of bones in many different kinds of armor that he wore. His nest, or lair, or den, I think it's called a den, had piles of bones which he would craft his equipment from. Some of those bones included those of wish dragons. Perhaps he hunted them. So that's most of the core background about the Ahamkara covered. Now we can actually start to dive into the history of these majestic beasts, which starts a long, long time ago. In this video, we'll be doing a summary of their time as mentioned in the history of the Hive and the Awoken. We'll be running up to the start of the Great Hunt, and we won't be covering the full length of Awoken history, because it actually spans across three videos. We will, however, be going over the more important beginning bits of it. Part 2 will likely be about Tales of the Hunt, the Great Hunt itself, that is, and Part 3 will probably cover the story of Riven more specifically, especially in the times after the hunt when she was the last known Ahamkara. For now, to start at this very beginning moment, the first ever reference to the Ahamkara is presumed to be in the Books of Sorrow. During the Hive's assault on a civilization known as the Harmony, the forces of Zivu Arath found themselves at a stalemate. The Harmony had turned to dragons, which the books note were capable of making wishes. Apparently, this was enough to stop Zivu Arath's forces for a time. There are two passages of note here. Zivu Arath uttered a verse in the Book of Sorrows recording the assault on the Harmony's worlds. Oryx's books then proceeded to tell how the Witch Queen helped defeat these dragons. These two passages are verses 5, 3, and 5, 4 of the Books of Sorrow. They read as follows. Verse 5-3 Pray and Sacrifice Uttered by Zivu Arath, God of War Harmony When the Traveler passed across Harmony, it lied to the orbits of ten worlds. Now they orbit the Black Hole. The Traveler lied to the accretion disk so that it would give warm light to these worlds. The Gift Mast When the Traveler left Harmony, it made a monument out of the black hole's polar jet. In the jet, there is a hollow mast which sings in radiance. This is the gift mast, and we will devour it. We will eat the sky out of it. We will snap it like a bone. The Harmony Sting The Harmony have weaponized their dead star. They can stimulate the accretion disk to fire relativistic plasma jets. We will take the sting. We will use it to burn their worlds. I will grant one Temple of Tribute to the first Descendant to kill a world. Oryx. I will have the Gift Mast to feast on. I will have it first. I am Zivu Arath and all war is my temple. Beware the daughters of Oryx, for they make and unmake with ease. Savathun. The deceitful sister will be distracted by Arcana and the song of the black hole. Treat her broods with contempt. The Traveler. We chase it, and we will devour it. The Deep will rule the cosmos. The Dragons. Our gods should be ours alone. A smug freedom is an insult to me. I'd shut them all in cells. Bring them to me. Zivu's reference of the dragons here is telling, and has been a source of nearly a decade's worth of speculative debate. The idea that the Ahamkara and the Worm Gods are somehow linked is given credence by this statement in Zivu's utterance, as well as by some of their shared powers. It raises questions about the veracity of this passage. It raises questions about the veracity of Truth to Power's notes about the Ahamkara and the Worm Gods being a separate species. For all the many similarities between the Worm Gods and the Ahamkara, we are no closer to an answer even after all these years. We've learned a little more about the origins of the Worm Gods, thanks to the presence of Asa within the story of the Season of the Deep and the Season of the Witch, but there are still very few answers as to what the relationship between the Worm Gods and the Ahamkara might be. Following this, there's the Hive record of the raid on the Gift Mast, which occurs immediately afterwards in verse 5-4. It reads as follows. 
Verse 5 4 The Gift Mast. It towers above this star system like a monument to treason. It beams with silver light. It sings a radio lullaby made of soothing lies. In its light live the harmony, and they are now our prey. Now arrives Zivor Rath at the head of her armada. She fights the Harmony for fifty years with strategy and discipline, but the Harmony turned to dragon wishes, and their wishful bishops wrestle Zivu in the Ascendant Plain. Zivu falls into deadlock. Now arrives Savathun, flanked by her chorus and her celebrants. They trick their way onto Anaharmony in disguises, so that they might vivisect these dragons. The Worm Our God laughs and laughs. For a hundred years, Savathun keeps secret covens among the Harmony. But first of all was Oryx, whose brood grew in secret places in the rubble of the accretion disk. The first navigator sends rocks and comets to crash into the Harmony worlds so that the Harmony fleet will be disarrayed. He sends cedars to infiltrate the Harmony worlds with his broods. Here, at the center of the fifth book, the hive has grown so mighty that it has made the annihilation of all false life routine. Zivor Rath kills the wishful bishops, and Savathun achieves some secret purpose, and Oryx's court tears down the gift mast. The Harmony people wail in terror, and they throw themselves into the silver lake of Anaharmony to drown. Come, saith Oryx, eat of the gift mast, for I am a generous god. Of its pieces I claim only two out of every five. The mast is full of the light of the traveler. It is full of the marrow taste of sky. All those who eat of it are filled with the ecstatic certainty that they serve a great and necessary purpose. Then say of Savathun, Siblings, listen, we must part ways a while so that we may grow different. She flies her war moons into the black hole, a throne becomes distant. Saith Zivur Rath, King Oryx, you take up too much space. Your power constrains too many choices. I must go away from you. She flies her war moons away into the night. Her throne is barred shut. Then Oryx was alone. He spent a while in thought, and those thoughts are recorded here. This moment is shrouded in legend because it's the moment when the Triumvirate of Hive Gods broke apart. It is less remembered for the acts of deception undertaken by Savathun, which all but assured the defeat of the Harmony through the destruction of the wish-giving dragons that were empowering their bishops. In Destiny's Law, there aren't many other mentions of wish dragons for a long time, but this, this is the first time it appears that they have arrived within the law, and if they do bear some relevance, to the Worm Gods, the Ahamkara, and maybe the Proto-Worm Gods such as Asa, understanding this story moment and their link to the Traveler may be important. The next tangible mention of them comes from the history of the Awoken. Some of you will already know the basic lore of the Awoken, for those of you who don't, here are the bits that are relevant. The Awoken themselves originated from a ship known as the Exodus Green, a human vessel that found itself in great calamity during the time of the Collapse. It fell into a singularity formed by both light and darkness. The world they crashed on within this singularity was known as the Distributory. Eventually, Marasov created a movement that split her people. Those that listened to her call would return with her to Sol. Those that opposed her remained in the relative paradise of the Distributory forever. When Mara and her Awoken arrived in the Reef, they discovered a dangerous system around them, one that had barely recovered from the Collapse. Mara and her people had existed in the Distributory for millions of years, but outside of the Singularity not much time had passed at all. As the Awoken arrived, they quickly discovered the Elixni Raiders that had occupied much of the Asteroid Belt and had established themselves there. Mara had proposed to journey to Sol initially so that they might assist their distant allies, humanity. The struggle that Mara had brought the people under her command to aid in was compelling. 
Many of them quickly demanded the opportunity to unite with humanity and assist them when they realized the terrible state that humanity was in. After some members of the fleet broke away from her, she gave everyone a single chance to leave forever. Thus, the Awoken had been riven twice, once as they left the distributary and once again as some of them left for Earth. This moment was one that significantly weakened Marasov's power. It had come about thanks to the presence of riots amongst the Awoken people that she had brought with her. Many had left her side. It was after that that an incursion by a force of Elixni forced Mara to adopt the role of a monarch officially. Her power was weaker in this moment, and she attempted to call her people back. This moment is recorded in the history of the Awoken people of the Reef. It is a moment where the Ahamkara emerged again. Mara made one more attempt, and only one, to call her scattered people home. She had hoped the assault would convince them they had a responsibility to the Reef, to come home and repair the damage they had caused. It went poorly, however, for though her tech witches were able to amplify her bonds to her people through the augments Kelder had developed, she was only one voice in a maelstrom. Her awoken had sensitive antennae, in the metaphysical sense, and could not hear her plea through the clamor. Also, the communications engineers kept forgetting to call Mara Majesty or Queen. Good news, Aldrin told her, with the grim delight he always showed after a debacle he had survived. Ilan and I went through the fallen communication logs. Their Baron never transmitted our position to his Kel. He wanted the prize for himself. We remain secure. The Baron might have planned a time-delayed beacon, Mara warned him. Never underestimate these beings. They've lived in the void longer than us. I already admire them. Aldrin confessed. They've lost so much. Some of them even ritually dismember themselves, Mara, to prove they have the strength to grow back the missing limbs. I tell you that even if we are doomed to dwindle and go extinct, those fallen may outlive us. Mara made a dry note in her log that her brother had at last discovered his true people. For her part, Sir Ido wandered about in a daze, filled with joy to be alive and grief that she no longer knew the day when she would die. In you, all things are possible, she told Mara. I live because of you. When Mara saw her string her mighty bow, the limbs coiled behind her legs and around her opposite arm. She was glad beyond telling that Sieur had survived. In time, Mara appointed paladins to oversee her new military, as Alice Lee had done during the Theodicy War. She created talented starfarers as corsairs to scour the asteroid belt in utmost secrecy and to establish routes and caches that would support the covert motion of awoken ships. Most of all, she charged her brother with the mission that occupied her thoughts. Brother, she said. Never again can I allow my people to be divided. We must offer them more than shielding, ice, and cold habitat cylinders and the warrens of Vesta. We must make a culture, a thread that binds us all in pride and wonder at the mystery of ourselves. Nowhere does culture flourish better than a city. Gather in one place, Aldrin warned, and make yourself a target. Mara had considered this and found an answer. Go forth and find me a power unknown to all the other powers of this world. Return it to me, and I shall make it the cornerstone of my new city, where the Awoken shall dream of all they have been and all that is yet to come. So Aldrin went out voyaging among the worlds, swift as a blue shift ghost. In time, he returned to the reef with a creature, not larger than his hand, saying, Behold, sister, the lie that makes itself true. This is an Ahamkara. It's here that Aldrin discovered the first of the Wish Dragons, and by returning this first one to Queen Mara Sov, a risky gambit had been enacted. Mara was only saved from true ruination by the power of this Wish Dragon by her own substantial paracausal abilities, 
For Mara, there was little difference between reality and what she desired. This left little room for wish dragons to exploit. Were it not for this, the Awoken story might have ended here and now. But thankfully, it continued. It was Mara alone who established a covenant with that young Ahamkara, which chose the use name Riven in honor of its host. It was Mara alone whose singular will and unity of purpose saved the Awoken from that which we now name the Anthem Anatheme. For there was in Mara very little division between reality as is and reality as desired. She was confident in her centuries of purpose and patient with the winding way by which the river of methods reaches the objective ocean. Blessed are those who in their absolute selfhood become selfless. Unappetizing are those who in their truest self-knowledge exclude the possibility of self-deceit. Mara, said Aldrin, Queen's brother, why do you forbid me to speak to the Ahamkara? This secret is mine alone, said Mara, Queen. She knew that her brother had only widened the gap between he as was, which is called Neum, and he as he would be, which is called Korst. Be gone to the outer worlds where I require thee. This was when Sieur Ido, having spoken to Kelda Wodge and to Asila, at last came before her queen. Kneeling, she said, Your Majesty, Kelda Wodge says you are a god, for there is no difference between your desire and reality. Yet I know that you desire things before they ever become real. Asila says that you are keeping a secret from your brother that he must never know. I think the secret is thus. You are now a god because one day you will become a god, and a god is not temporal. Your brother is not a god because he will never become a god. Shall I worship you? Sieur, Mara said, falling to her knees, clutching her beloved's face between shaking hands. Sieur, on the day you worship me, you cannot love me anymore, for to worship is to yield all power and I cannot love what has no power over me. At this, the Ahamkara coiled around her neck, yawned and showed its fangs, for there was a crevice between what was and what was wanted. I see, Sir Ido said. Then to me, you are not yet a god. Although in time the knowledge of what Mara would become pushed them apart, it was a kind and happy push, as a friend might urge a beloved companion onward to a distant opportunity, and their days together were spent gladly. Riven in this moment gleaned the smallest understandings of what Marasov wished, but the consequences of such a moment would not reveal themselves for some time. For the time being, there was a city to build and a society to nurture, from the will of the Awoken and the wish magic of the Ahamkara, a secret bastion was formed this place would come to be known as the Dreaming City. We built the Dreaming City with the help of Ahamkara. Their wishes fueled our innovations, but it was our own ingenuity that shaped our evolution as a people. Wishes only go so far with the short-sighted and unimaginative. Thanks to Shirochi's patrol missions, the pilgrimage missions, we have a ton of dialogue about the creation of the Dreaming City, which gives us specific information about the Ahamkara, like how they used to arrive within the city that they helped to create, and the protective measures that the Awoken would use to guard against some of the effects of their wish magic. The Ahamkara always came and went from the Dreaming City by way of this platform which meant they always pass by these geodes. We use them as protective measures. Shiny surfaces can reveal some of the Ahamkara's secrets, if you know what to look for. Perhaps it isn't surprising that a reflective surface like that of the geodes is a counter to wish magic, which relies so heavily on perception. It always seems to rely on those wishing looking directly into the dragon's eyes, in a sense, then, this effect is somewhat like the mythology of Perseus and the Gorgon Medusa. A reflective surface allowed Perseus, the hero in this Greek tale, to avoid eye contact that would have sealed his fate. According to Shurochi, 
This is because of the changes in perception and expectation that a reflective surface can impart. Reflections are powerful things. They can disarm certain kinds of magic. Wish magic in particular is susceptible, since it is so heavily dependent on expectation and perception. The relationship between the Awoken and the Ahamkara was one that was persistently filled with a degree of danger, but for a time they lived in relative harmony. We can see this based on the way that the Ahamkara followed along with the traditions that the Awoken would create. Take the implementation of this Pillars tradition of being the spot where bargains were undertaken between the Awoken and the Dragons. The Awoken knew the Ahamkara long before the Guardians ever noticed them. We made our alliances and cut our deals at this pillar. And for the most part, we lived alongside each other. Dozens of Ahamkara have crawled or flown or slithered across this platform since it was built. They had the power to change their shape, to reform themselves to match the expectation of their beholders. We expected nothing of them, and so they came as they were. It was here that we first struck an agreement with the Ahamkara, and here that we met the very last of them. Those creatures have keen memories, and they love patterns and ceremony. When you start a tradition with them, they follow it through. The Awoken lived in relative harmony alongside the Ahamkara, with Riven in particular forming a strong bond with Queen Mara Sov. In some ways, Riven and Queen Mara were cooperative, although I don't believe it could ever truly be described as a trustworthy relationship given the clear power of the two individuals, and Riven's, well, nature to consume desire based on what is and what is not. She knew that even as powerful and as controlled as Mara was, there was still room for her desires to be different from the world around her. I think the nature of this relationship is well documented in the actual encounter that's listed in the Riven law entry, which makes note about an interaction between Riven and Mara. Take a listen. Mara sits cross-legged in the canopy shade of Riven's wings. She wets the pad of her thumb with the tip of her tongue, then uses the moisture to hold a bundle of fresh-picked asphodelia in place. She ties off the stems with a length of silk-spun gold thread, then begins the mindless busywork of braiding in all the expected accoutrements. A serrated fang, a shotgun shell, a cloudy amethyst crystal. Riven turns to watch. On this day, her head is the size of a fallen pike. She is vibrant blue, with a yellow and red crest and her pupils are crescents within her lidless eyes. After a time, she says, Madad is dead, but you make him no bouquet. Mara looks up, struck by the novelty of the moment. She studies Riven, and swallows the first words that come to her tongue, which are, Madad's bones are whispering at this very moment on Venus. Instead, she asks, you mourn him. That crescent pupil contracts as thin as a sickle's edge. No. Having found the true answer, Mara resumes her work. A while passes in silence until she says, Ahamkara have no traditions. No. No sentiment? No. Mara bites off a piece of thread. Why did you allow my brother to spirit you away? You know this truth, wise queen. He is so full of succulence. Hmm. And why do you roost here when there is such rich hunting beyond my reef? Truly, I say to you... Here, Mara hides a small smile. The Awoken have entrusted what will be to you, their queen, and thus they are all dry as a stone to me. Pleasantly so, for wetness is sweet feed, but dry stone is a friendly basking place. You. You are as hot and flat as the plateaus of mercury, and your heat stirs my blood to move. 
Mara nods and says nothing more. Though she thinks a while on the three-parted curse used by Ahamkara to mark their prey, the shackle between appellated and appalling. When she finishes her memorial bouquet, she unfolds herself and rises to stretch. Riven does the same. And as she relaxes, she spreads and shuffles and shakes her pinions until they all lie straight. The land around them is shapeless rock that will become an obeyed to those left behind. Mara will honor her enemies and friends alike in stone. She will build grand cathedrals veneered in amethyst and agate. Riven butts her rounded snout under Mara's hand and waits. Let us find Keldawaj, Mara says. This relationship between Riven and Mara was seemingly typical of the relationship between many powerful Ahamkara and Awoken. That is to say that they were able to live in relative harmony. Whilst there could never truly be complete trust, the Ahamkara had helped the Awoken to create the Dreaming City, and bargains were undertaken within the confines of known risk. It's fair to also say that some of the Awoken who had completely entrusted themselves to Mara's care and believed wholeheartedly in her vision would have no desires of their own. Such was their faith. Such was the extent of their desires, or the lack thereof. There are, however, some amongst the Ahamkara who notably would betray the Awoken for their own ends. There are two notable examples. They are named Iao and Arizim. Some of Destiny 1's veterans will definitely know one of these wish dragons. They happen to be a very popular hunter exotic. Their stories are unconnected, but the little tragedies that they present are different in certain ways. Each of their stories are recalled by the Tekian Shurochi in the Dreaming City. Let's start with Iao first. This bowl was once a nest for Iao. He was a sly little Ahamkara, always laughing, always twining around your legs, whispering lies, saying, I have seen your eyes, O oh, witch mage mine. We never expected him to go bad. This was once a resting place for an Ahamkara who loved stories. He would recite all of our myths, Name all of our heroes. And that's where we went wrong. We should have never trusted him to keep our secrets. This little chamber was once a home for an Ahamkara who betrayed the Awoken. He crept out of the Dreaming City and went to whisper in the ears of warlocks who wondered who we were. And so we had to kill him. The warlocks too. Ah, this is where Yao liked to rest, before Sior hunted him down and skewered him for his deceit. One of your warlocks bartered for his corpse and traded away his bones. Another mistake. You must never scatter the bones. The first thing I learned from all this was that for almost half a decade, I've been pronouncing Yao wrong. Embarrassing that I used to call it Eo, but I suppose there was no way of knowing when it was just words on a page. Embarrassing, but we persist through anything we might consider cringe. Lord knows I have to. Eao's story is a reflection of the necessary secrecy that was imposed by the Awoken. It makes clear the monstrous ends that they were willing to go to to protect the Dreaming City, including murdering those who were involved in Eao's legend. It also makes me glad that we didn't have the bones of Eao in Destiny 2, a sentence I didn't think I'd be uttering, but at very least for a narrative reason it makes sense. If we'd entered the Dreaming City wearing the bones, it might have been grounds for our execution as well as any who had seen us wearing that exotic. This isn't the only time Sir Ido was sent out to find a rogue Ahamkara though. This is where we move our story on to Azirim, the other treacherous Ahamkara. His betrayal is one that is most certainly more easily defined, and has led directly to the deaths of an entire young generation of Awoken. His story is recalled again by Shuro Chi. Take a listen. A great tragedy once occurred at these cliffs. It was early in our relationship with the Ahamkara, before we'd learned their tricks, 
before we'd learned how best to live alongside them without becoming their prey. Dozens of good people died walking over these cliffs. They were lured to their death by an Ahamkara during a celebration of the solstice. These creatures, they can turn on you in an instant if you aren't wary. This was the site of a mass murder. An Ahamkara of immense power tricked dozens of civilians into walking right off the edge of these cliffs. We saved none of them. And to our great shame, the Ahamkara, Azarim he was called, escaped. Step past the tree, peek down over the ledge. That drop goes on for some time. Now imagine a voice whispering to you, luring you, promising you that your feet will find solid ground where in truth there is only air. Ahamkara lies. The exact nature of the massacre is actually recorded in the lore. It's in the Azarim lore entry, and it reads as follows. And when the second solstice began in earnest, many Awoken and Ahamkara alike came to the Dreaming City to celebrate the delirious pleasure of being alive. Those who came arrived in the gardens of Asila, and Azarim was the very last. Seeing him land, Asila said to him, Ah, you are bold. Do you think you've earned the right to revel in this place? And Azarim answering said, Please, wise lady, I've gone round the worlds and through the stars themselves. I have come only to congratulate your people. If you lend me your ear, I can prove I will not waste the mercy you might grant me. And Asila said to him, We've often lent our ear to your indiscretions. I know what happens to that which is lent to you. I need no assurance. And Azarim answering said, My indiscretions? Wise lady, I do admit, I may have whispered truths you gave to me to deceive those who would deceive me. But have I ever struck out with hungry fang against your people? Have I set fire to your trust? I have seen the error of my ways. Let me prove to you, oh, how I have changed. And Asila, though she could see a flickering in Azarim's reflection, could not resist a redemption story. Asila cast forth her hand and beckoned to Azarim in mercy. And Asila said to him, Join us and be glad, but let me hear your testimony first. And so invited, Azarim bowed his crested head and hid a secret smile and spoke with the pardon Asila had given him. He recounted his many regrets in deceiving the kind merchants in the capital city of Interamnia. He recounted his charity to the wayfaring corsairs who could not have escaped the Heliopause without his aid. He recounted his journey to retrieve the Utex stolen from Pallas by the profane scavengers, the Fallen, and he named his friends and those who had shown him kindness. And from the raucous parties beyond the lush gardens of Asila came an audience of Techians in training and flush-cheeked young corsairs. They knelt in the dewy grass, and they listened. And as they listened, and as Azarim spoke, his appetite grew and grew. Night fell on the dreaming city. And Azarim said to those who knelt enraptured, Come, let me sing to you of extinction. Let me sing to you of lives lost in beautiful places, O oh, audience mine. Sing with me. Sing. He bade them rise and led them singing down and away from the gardens of Asila. He spread his wings and flew out into the empty air beyond the steep cliffs that bordered the garden. And to those who happened to glance towards the gardens from far off pavilions, it seemed like a merry parade. A joyous chorus. And they did not hear the singing stop, and they did not hear the bodies dashed against the shore below, and they did not see Azarim grow, or laugh, or flee. It's perhaps the most overt of examples, but this highlights the danger that Ahamkara can present. Their intentions are their own, 
but they are all metaphysical predators no matter what. If they sense desire, then they will feed upon it. It also displays the immediate power of the Ahamkara. Azarim's ability to enchant a young awoken audience of Tekians and Corsairs is a terrifying thing. Tekians are powerful paracausal beings in their own right, modified with special technology that allows them to amplify the power of Mara Sov. And Corsairs are great warriors and fighters, as capable and skillful with a knife and a rifle as they might be with a fighter. For so many of them to have fallen into the hands and clutches of a terrible Ahamkara's power, and to have then simply been killed by one promise, it's troubling to say the least and is a representation of how powerful the Wish Dragons can be. If even some powerful Awoken can be pulled into a trance like that, then we Guardians might well be susceptible as well. So with that said, I've... Oh, wow, I've come to... Almost the end of... No, not almost the end of my script. Yep, okay, this is actually the point at which I've cut it because it's got to 15 pages. So this is where we'll cut this video for now. In the next few videos, we'll be looking at the Great Hunt, we'll be looking at a bunch of Riven's machinations with Mara, we'll be looking at the creation of the Blind Well and Eleusinia, we'll be looking at all that stuff, but that's still to come. There are a few other videos in this series, and, well, there's lots of important dragon story beats to cover. So, if you've enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like, and if you've seen anything in the lore that I've missed, go ahead and leave that in the comments section as well. I want to make sure that my coverage of all this is as comprehensive as possible. Of course, if you enjoyed this, go ahead and subscribe so you can get part two and part three. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, has been quite enough for me, and that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife, Rodasia Adastra. I'll see you, Starside.